Fundraisers today are around lifestyle. They're around events, right? So learning their lifestyle, learning what type of event they're going to want to participate is going to move the needle for anyone in the organization who is responsible on, on building these initiatives. On this episode of Mind Your Business, I'll be catching up with Moshe Hecht of Hatch, Hatch.ai, and formerly of Charity.com. Why am I adding that? Well, <laughs> He has a tremendous knowledge in the world of nonprofits and of donors and of securing major gifts. And in fact, on this episode, we'll be talking about this incredible platform, Hatch. What does Hatch do? It provides organizations, directors of development, executive directors, real-time, real-world knowledge on your donors. And of course, why is that so important? Because that opens the world for greater gifts from your existing donors and the path to new donors. Enjoy this episode. Moshe Hecht of Hatch. Thank you for joining me here on this episode of Mind Your Business. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Yitzhak, for having me. Amazing. So jumping right in, Moshe, you originally helped start and found charity. The world knows about charity, the incredible impact that it's had for so many organizations of so many sizes around the country, around the world. Around. Globally, yes. Globally. You then founded Hatch. Hello. <laughs> what was the reason you were, you know, charity is doing very well and it's still doing very well, and you left to found Hatch. What, what was that all about? Yeah. So, you know, I'm obviously very proud of my uh, time um, and of the team at, at, at charity. And like you said, charity continues to thrive as a, a, great, a great company, a great organization. Um, I would say, you know, it was probably around 2020, where a real unmet need started to surface with many of our customers. And then I also learned, which was actually a industry-wide challenge. And I'll give you a little bit of an anecdote. You know, so we would work with organizations. On average, our campaign sizes were around a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits of raising a million dollars, not just raising a million dollars, but it's also getting thousands of new mm -hmm. people into your database, thousands of new donors. And many times, roughly nine, 10 months after the, after their campaign, I would speak to the organizations ready and preparing them on their next year campaign. And I would mm -hmm. say, well, you got 10,000 sometimes right. new people in your database. And I'd say, well, how did the year go by of you maximizing and monetizing? all these new constituents. And unfortunately, nine times out of 10, they would say, you know what? We haven't really tapped into that base. And immediately when I would ask them, why have you not done mm -hmm. that? I mean, these are new donors. Uh, for, new relationships. For new relationships. And they said, you know, it's interesting. We have the data on them, but we don't have enough data on them. So we have their name, their email, their phone number. Maybe they've given an $18 gift. Maybe they've even given an $1,800 gift, but we don't have the information that can inform a greater relationship, a greater size gift, deeper engagement. And from that problem is where Hatch was born. Okay. So let's get a little bit you know, more into the depth of what Hatch really is. That answer was a teaser. <laughs> what is Hatch all about? Yeah. What, what do you, what, what problem do you solve in the marketplace? Yes. So imagine you can get in more information on those people. So after some research over those years, 2019, 2020, 2021, I did some pretty heavy research into the industry. And what I found out is that there are actually hundreds of data points, if curated properly, available on most people in the on the internet. So, you know, say you would do a Google search on someone. If you mm -hmm. spent five hours on Yitzhak Saflis, you'd find out a lot of information, right? The challenge is bringing all of that information into one single location and creating what we call at Hatch a complete human profile. So what we've done is we've created a database where we gather information from roughly 40 different public sources. So information like the IRS, the FEC, the SEC, different social data, live news, live tweets. And we put that together into complete human profile. And now the organization can visualize what before Hatch was maybe this one or two dimensional line mm -hmm. in a CRM mm -hmm. now becomes this three dimensional person, this three dimensional individual where they can learn their preferences, their lifestyle and so on. A mutual friend, Rabbi Richard Beeler. Sure. <laughs> he actually, I remember at a conference probably two decades ago, 
He said when he walks into the room, he looks at what's on the credenza of an executive. He looks at the, what are the framed photos that are on the wall? What are the awards? Because then I'll have an idea of what he's proud of. So what you're telling me is that Hatch really gets this multi-dimensional view of a donor because the more you understand your donor, the more deeper the relationship you can get into. Yeah. You know, I've obviously a lot of respect for, for, for Richard, uh, but that was 20 years ago. Um, and those awards and those, let's say, wealth signals or those signals of their lifestyle and their accomplishments, it's all digital today. Right. So all of those things are either featured in a media that they were thing or, mm-hmm. or it's or it's put onto some uh, t- onto some website or is filed in some in, in, in some database. So Hatch is essentially the 21st century digital version of Richard Beeler's uh, X-ray <laughs> professional fundraiser vision. Now, I, I almost can you know want to guess this, but I really want to put it on, you know, light at your doorstep. You know, you could have you could have named this platform many different names. You chose Hatch. Yeah. <laughs> What's the story behind that? Yeah, I, I think it's twofold. Um, over my career, um, you know, marketing, branding, positioning has been a big part of my career through mm-hmm. different uh, jobs and companies that I've that that I've started. So I think on the one hand, it, I think it fits a lot of the good best practices for a solid name. Um, it's obviously something it's that people remember people have when they see when they hear the word hatch it's a visual that they have right away in their mind mm-hmm. it's one syllable it's five letters yeah. it's very easy it's easy to remember just as, as as a name but i think as it applies to the actual industry it, it really describes what we're doing before hatch an individual in your database who would otherwise been ignored because he was not born yet <laughs> in the eyes of the of the fundraiser or the eyes of the project manager or the eyes of the uh, peer-to-peer campaign manager when you give them this information it gives you this visual of this person being born being born with now all this new information and all these new opportunities that this you know person who is responsible for deepening this engagement with this individual. So I think it's really, it's 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 a name that that was born and hatched from <laughs> twenty years of 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 both branding, marketing, and also understanding this space really really well. Moshe, what is the process for an organization when it comes to you? And I'm going to break this question really into two parts. What is the turnaround? Like for when an organization reaches out and we all know they need it yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So does it take a week, a month, you know, 90 days? Uh, and then also once they're engaged with Hatch, how often can they log in? How often can they expect updates on information on their donors? Sure. So let's start with the first question of what are the process with an organization coming to us? So an organization will come to us with their existing database, okay? And they'll either um, export and import it from their existing CRM, or we actually have integrations with with some particular uh, CRMs, and uh, they will upload their data into our platform. Now, their data usually on average constitu- can constitutes about eight, nine pieces of information. So first name, last name, email, phone number, mailing address, email address, maybe date of birth sometimes, maybe some donation history, but it's usually under 10 pieces of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Within, once they upload their database, if they, let's say, have a database the size of 10,000 people, within an hour, all of the enrichment data will already have been populated. And that's about 80 new pieces of information per individual uh, uh, per individual in their database. So it'll nearly 10x the information that, that on, on this individual gathered from over 40 sources. Um, and it'll around 10,000 people usually takes about an hour. That's because we've built out um, all of the systems and the storing of the data and the connections and the API connections to the data to happen it almost, almost, almost imminently. Now, now, one second, Moshe. I know you for a while, so I know you're an honest person, but I'm sorry I'm finding this hard to believe. 10,000 people in a house yeah. file. They upload it to your platform within 60, I, I'm not going to say 60 to 90 minutes yeah. because I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm extending the time you said, within 60 minutes, yeah. they will have 
for their 10,000 names. And a complete comprehensive profile. Is the person yeah. a Yankees fan? Are they a Mets fan? Do they like, and the list goes on and on and on. In fact, I'm going to even now turn back to you. How many different like data points could you even like think of? I mean, what, what their shoe size? I mean, like, well, what, what, yeah. what do you, like, so the, the data some is, examples. Yeah, the data is quite comprehensive. Um, and it's, I want to remind everybody, this is all public information. So this isn't, we're not getting, um, you know, you're not, they're not, we're not getting their social security number. So we're getting information that technically speaking, if you would go on each individual and do a deep Google search or go through certain databases and cer certain clearinghouses. And you have you a could, lot of time to burn. Yeah. And you have a lot of, the, you could technically get this information. Um, the information is coming from areas like the IRS. So the, every 990 that is filed for organizations and the um, the grant giving foundations, for example, they have to file the key personnel, but that are behind those those foundations. So those people will come up in, in our database. SEC, so Security and Exchange Commission. So anybody who is an SEC insider that owns 10% of a publicly traded company or is a director of a publicly traded company, they have to file their earnings in that company. And we connect those earnings to the live ticker of what that stock is on that on that day. The FEC, which is the Federal Election Committee, so anybody who gives a donation, a federal do um, donation to a politician in the United States, that's all public. Oh, so these are all public information. Now, to go and get this information from public from sources take is very, very cumbersome. Now, what we've done is, the reason why it takes so quickly is because, first of all, we store a lot of this data in our own database. So we have the entire, for example, entire IRS database of over a decade already stored in our database. So to pull that information is milliseconds. Some information we're getting through licensing through third parties that were connected to an API. And also by pulling that information through that API also takes milliseconds. We're getting live um, news. We're getting it straight from Google feed. So that also comes in, 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 in real time. It's every single data point either is either stored or connected to a real time source. And that's how we were able to get the information in such a quick, uh, in such a quick manner. Now, this next question really feeds on, on your, the previous answer. And that is, I mean, to get, even to use that example, 10,000 names in a house file and to have that built out with the amount of information that you're providing for an organization within an hour, you obviously leverage a lot of technology. Yeah. Is it, am I asking you a question that's confidential? Like, could you share like, what's the, the kind of the brains behind Hatch? Yeah. Besides the physical individuals like yourself that are behind. Yeah. It's like, I can tell you, but then, you know, I'll have to, um, no. So, <laughs> uh -oh. um, okay. So, there's no question that this is a big technical lift, um, and um, which was a big project. Uh, just to give you a bit of a sense of the enormity of the project, you know, um, and this is all public information. You know, the company was started three years ago. Uh, we had uh, three previous rounds of, fundry, fund, of funding, so we've raised over two point three million dollars to date. We actually uh, this week. God willing, are closing our seed round, which would be north of $3 million. Um, so collectively, um, Hatch has raised over $5 million of, 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 of venture funding. Um, and I think that speaks to the enormity of the technical lift that is needed for a, 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 a technology of this sort, because it is very, very complicated um, and very, um, you know, when you think about getting, I'll tell you what's just to give you a picture, like getting this data, licensing the data, that's obviously a cost, that's everything. The biggest complication here is what's called entity resolution. So if I'm getting, you give me, you have a John Smith in your database. Mm -hmm. And you know how many John Smiths there are in the United States? <laughs> I had to guess, I don't know, 50,000? 45,000. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Pretty good. <laughs> that's, that's very close. <laughs> by the way, by the way, as of the research that I've done, it's probably as close to 50,000. That's actually there. When <laughs> I did the research a year, two years ago, it was 45,000. Today, there's probably 50,000 John Smiths in the United States. So let's say you're a nonprofit and you have a John Smith in your database. So for me to get John Smith, the accurate information from the, of your John Smith mm -hmm. and not another John Smith mm -hmm. from 40 different sources, over 80 different pieces of information that to create those matches and to cross pollinate that information, that takes a lot of algorithmic writing. Okay. That takes a lot of AI predictions. Okay. That takes a lot of work. And that's where a lot of our technical work has gone into. We have data engineers, 
data scientists, um, front end, back end developers that have developed the system. We've created, uh, you know, we don't get it 100% right on every single individual, but therefore we've created a beautiful UI and UX of giving different scores for individual. What's the likelihood that the, that the match improving the, the matches over time? So the real techni technical challenge over here is because there are 40, 50,000 now okay. John Smiths in the United States getting the right information from so many different locations to 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 append and to enrich this profile in real time it's 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 a huge technical challenge we've gotten to a critical place in this technical challenge where we've been able to deliver an MVP you know a minimal viable product to our customers where they're like okay we can use this but we do have a really long way to go um in terms of proving the accuracy improving the 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 ma the uh, the, uh, the match rate um, for each profile now just a key question because i don't want anyone who's watching this to say like okay this sounds like an amazing invention maybe i'll reach out to them in a year or two my understanding is you have Presently, as of now, March 2024, north of 150 active clients. Is yes. that correct? Yes, we have. Uh, yes, we have uh, three major universities that are using us. We have um, one nonprofit that is a national chain of over 35 chapters across wow. across the United States. I hesitate just for privacy reasons to say names of, 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 of these nonprofits, but um, do inquire. And we could give you another confidentiality. We can tell you who our, our clients are, but we have clients that have over a million people in their database that have been around. One of our clients has been around for over a hundred years. Wow. So we definitely have um, um, deep into uh, the nonprofit space in North America. Now, we've, we, we've come from a certain angle in the first part of, of, of this episode, but now I just want to come at, come, kind of come at you with a straight up question. And that is at the end of the day, a fundraiser, an executive director, how could they maximize the benefits, their return through your platform, Hatch? Hatch really benefits two different categories of people responsible for raising funds in their nonprofit, okay? Mm -hmm. So number one is the fundraisers, the major gift officers, the directors of development who are responsible for raising major funds. Mm -hmm. And what we, one of the uh, motivations of building this platform was that we don't ignore the second category, which are the peer-to-peer -peer campaign managers, the crowdfunding um, managers, and it helped, the platform helps them too. So let's start with the, with the, with the major gift officers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So- if you're a major gift officer, um, your your job is to build relationships assen okay. uh, essentially um, with 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 philanthropists. Um, and in order to build those relationships, the more information that you know about those people, like a good friend knows right. knows what a good friend how he thinks, how he eats, where he likes to visit, what's his what what inspires him, what motivates what what, mo mm -hmm. what motivates him, right? Mm -hmm. So the information that we give to major gift officers and to um, fundraisers is information that. That help first of all gives you the idea of what their per, per, you know capacity is. Yeah. Okay. Right. So if he's giving to you to a thousand dollars to your organization, and you can see clearly on Hatch that he's giving to another organization ten thousand or fifty thousand or hundred thousand dollars, that right away qualifies him for a greater gift. Okay. But that's not enough. You want to be able to see well. What are the types of other organizations that he's given right. to? Does he give to religious causes? Does he give to educational causes? Does he give to environmental causes? Okay, because within your organization, that might, might that might check something off the list of qualifying that ask, mm -hmm. or might move you to say, you know what, this program is not the right program that I should be asking for him about because let's say I'm a institution that has both educational programs and environmental programs when you want to shift them that ask to what they care, care about more. There are other wealth signaling also tools in the organization. So you might not be able to see their public gifts and see that they gave another organization a million dollars, but you can see things like their Real estate holdings, wealth signals, their assets, how much their you know their, their wealth, how much, what kind of home they, they they live in. Are they are they the owner of the home? Other wealth s signals that can inform you know how, when, and how much to ask for those major for those major donors. And that's typically goes into the category of what we call wealth screening in this industry. And hatches, in my opinion, best in class on wealth screening. Now, the second category are peer to peer campaign managers and crowdfunding, which is really why this thing was born. 
right? So if I'm running a peer-to-peer campaign and I need a hundred bikers for for my for my uh, mm-hmm. bike bikeathon, okay, this is this is a real. I'm going to give you a real case s- scenario. We had an organization that in the previous year <clears throat> had 50 people do running do, doing their bikeathon. Okay, mm-hmm. they came on to Hatch. They had, I think, roughly twelve or thirteen thousand people in the in in their database. Okay. okay, with three little clicks of button filters, they were able to find one hundred and sixty seven people in their organization that were interested in biking. Wow. Okay, because they was listed on their social media as interested in cycling. They probably could have found more if they would have been like if they're outdoorsy or if they work at a bike mm-hmm. company or mm-hmm. if they're a physical therapist. But they left it at people who were clearly. Um, it's saying that they're skilled or interested in biking. They got 167. They narrowed that down. They put a volunteer on calling those specific 167 people, and they got over 20 new cyclists for their peer-to-peer campaign for for that year. So this is a way to help peer-to-peer campaignings. Um, It's a tool that is for the fundraisers. It's a tool that are for the peer-to-peer campaign managers, for the crowdfunding managers, for the event planners. You can go into Hatch. I hear here, I'm going to say this guaranteed. Okay. Okay. And you can catch me on this and you get your a free year subscription. If Whoa. you have, if you okay. have over 5,000 people in your database okay. and I can't find you more than 30 people in your database that love golf, you get your free year subscription for free. Because you take any 5,000 people out there, we're going to be able to find critical mass of people that love golf. So the next time you're running your peer-to-peer golf event, Hatch is going to help identify those people who are either skilled, interested, spend their time doing the, the lifestyle things that your, that, your, that your fundraisers are about because it's no longer just about money anymore with, with fundraising. Fundraisers today are around lifestyle. They're around events right? So f- learning their lifestyle, learning what type of event they're going to want to participate is going to move the needle for anyone in the organization who is responsible on, on building these initiatives. Now, just an interesting question here. A, a, a short while ago, you had mentioned that within an hour after an organization engages with Hatch, they're getting critical information at their fingertips. How often are they getting updates? How often should they be logging in? Any yeah, type of- so that's a great question. So Hatch is built as a platform to be used on a daily basis. And the reason is, aside for the pricing, there's the, it's a software as a service model, but for the main reason is that the the data is updated in real time relevant to the to how, where the, how the data is updated in its source, okay? So let's take worst case scenario, if the data is coming from the IRS or from an annual report, it's updated annually, right. okay? Now let's go down to job jobs. Jobs are being updated um, up in social media all the time. We're, we're scanning job sources every quarter, okay? Let's go further down. What if it's a tweet? Well, a tweet should be, is daily, we're scanning Twitter or X, whatever we're calling it these days, on a daily basis. If it's media, we're getting on a daily basis. If it's stock movements, we're getting on a daily basis. So when you log into Hatch, everything represents more or less real time as that data, as people are growing, as people are evolving, as people are changing positions, as people are changing careers. So the data is real time. So it's worth it for an organization to come in on a day-to-day basis to see how is, how is my community growing? I will I'd just like to add, we actually have a feature called Hatch Live, which is a live ticker of what's happening in your database right now. So you go on to Hatch Live, we'll show you whose birthday it is today. We'll show you who tweeted today. We'll show you who put up a YouTube video today if they have a, a, a YouTube channel and many other things that are happening. It's kind of like a real-time feed of your community, specifically your people in your database. For people out there, in the nonprofit space, later we're going to touch on because I'm saying to myself, you got to have a tool for corporate. But I, we're going to touch on that a little later. In the nonprofit world, they're listening to this and they want more information. What's the website? Hatch.ai. Moshe Hecht of Hatch, Hatch.ai. Moshe, perhaps you could share a story uh, from an organization, obviously not sharing the particular name of an organization where Hatch made a huge difference. Now, by the way, the whole interview here is 45, 50 minutes. You probably can go on (laughs) for hours where you made a huge difference, but maybe like one story that really brings it home. Yeah, I'll tell you two two anecdotes, two stories on kind of the the opposite sides of of the sizes of the organization. So one from a really small organization and one from a, you know, more substantiated organization. So uh, we have an organization that's 
young. It's only about uh, three or four years old. Had a small database, updated, updated, uploaded in, 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 into Hatch, got all this new information. And um, three or four months into the, the platform, I get this WhatsApp message from 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 the customer. Uh, Mush, you're not going to believe it. I found this person in in the database, and here's the story. He basically put this individual in the database, knew very very little about, uh, about her. She was a woman that lived in her, in, in in her community, and on Hatch told him critical information. Hatch told her that she was an author. Okay, mm. Hatch told her that she gave. Um, very serious, uh, significant um, uh, size gift to political causes very frequently. Okay. It actually told her his, her age. So it was able to get an age range and, and just other information. And then once he got that information out, she kind of did some other re- re- research. He says, I went into that meeting so confident and so prepared. And he said he made sure to compliment her on the book. Which other you otherwise would not have, right. which otherwise right. wouldn't have known. Right. He made sure um, some of the things that he brought up in the conversation. He made sure not to make a Biden joke, okay, <laughs> because he saw where her political leaning was. So he might otherwise have been a little bit looser, talk, talk, talk a little politics, make a joke. He made sure not to make that joke because he saw where her political leanings were, were going. Finally, he knew exactly what size gift to ask for. He asked for an $1,800 gift because that was the average size gift of her giving to other organizations and to her political size gift. And she closed right there and she gave him an $1,800 gift. Um, and he, uh, you know, he, he, it, he gives so much credit. Obviously, it's him. He had to do the ask. But he said that that meeting was so pleasant and was so successful because I think he texted, this was about a year ago. He texted me like two months, two months ago. He says, Moshe, well, you know, I got another $1,800 gift from her. And he, you know, for him, he feels like a lot of this um, is credit to the information that he was able of to get and how smooth that operation was with, with her. Another, another, another anecdote. So there's an organization that is a day school. Mm-hmm. In the United States, mm-hmm. and they were running a multi-million dollar um, capital campaign. Okay, um, almost a ten million dollar c- c- capital campaign, and they hired a fundraising consultant who otherwise would have been working with them uh, um, through this c- capital campaign as a capital campaign consultant, and she used this. She u- used Hatch for six months. To plan this campaign because we didn't get too much into the details, but you can create segmentations, you can create workflow on Hatch, you can create tags and sorts and filter. She was on this platform hours and hours a week, managing and planning the entire crowdfunding campaign. And there's and and the feedback that I got back from from mm-hmm. from the head of this school, he's like, there is no question that a million new dollars was raised from this campaign because of Hatch. Another thing is is that it didn't only give them information on the you know the lead gift for the capital campaign and the mid level gift. It also Hatch gives new phone numbers and emails. So he said that he's had a, part of the capital campaign was also a crowdfunding component, right? And um, he's done crowdfunding in the past. He said he doubled his efficiency on his crowdfund on his call center for their for their last bit that they raised because they had new phone numbers and accurate ones. Yes, and, and accurate email yes, addresses. Yes, so he doubled his efficiency on his call center on his operations room because of all the new data points that Hatch was able to uh, pr- provide Animal. for 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 this campaign. So those are you know two different. Types of sides stories, of the stories that really shows the benefits of what Hatch. I loved uh, about even the first story was that what to do and what not to do. Mm, mm. That's it's, sure. that's what data is all about. Yeah, data, data is king, right? And data is yeah. Now, yeah, especially in those film, you know, in those yeah. one-on-one conversations, you, you want to align yourselves with these philanthropists as much as you can, and you want to be careful because yeah. a, a lot of them have. You know they didn't they didn't become philanthropists because they weren't have strong opinions <laughs> because they didn't you know they weren't strong about certain things so as a, as a fundraiser you want to be you should always be sensitive but it's good to know a little bit more information and what areas to be extra sensitive. Now here's a key question that really it, it's in the minds of anyone involved in the world of fundraising. You know, are you focusing on your existing donors? or on your new donors? Are you going at, it's house fall versus acquisition. Hmm. Now, I, I would imagine, again, in, 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 in your world, you're, you're pulling information from your existing database. Hmm. 
why is it important and why is it important to first focus on your house fall, yeah. focus on your existing relationships, and perhaps is that the pathway for acquiring new major gifts? Yeah. So and major donors, yeah, new so, major donors. Yeah. So every organization has to be focused on their existing constituents and simultaneously be focusing on, you know, building out their pipeline and building out new people in the database. But what my advice and what Hatch follows this mantra, um, for any organization that's been around roughly five years, raises, you know, north of two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, right? That's kind of the, I, we can't really help organizations that are less than that. So if they're just start, if they're just startups, like really just right out of the gate, at this point there really isn't a much that we can provide. We do have a separate product within Hatch called Open Giving, which you can do research through all grant giving foundations. So we could help you identify grant givers and the key personnel behind them as a startup and that's free that we give to startup organizations. But to answer your question when it comes to, you know, building your database versus, you know, going deeper or going broader. So what I always tell organizations that if, again, if you, if you hit this, if you fit this criteria, you've been around for a few years, you have a database, all your hopes and dreams are right under your nose. Mm. Because even if you do have to build your database and, and you have to, the best place to start is with your existing database. Because what I find is that nonprofits are ignoring 90% of their existing constituents. Wow. They're focusing on their major donors, their most active supporters, but they're ignoring the rest of their database, 90% of those people. And in that 90% are more major donors, mid-tier donors, armies of, of modest donors, social influencers today. So it's not just about money, but it's about how mm -hmm. they can propel your organization through, through their social influence. Go deeper on your existing constituents, learn more ab about them, build those relationships, and then word of mouth, they're going to be inspired and motivated to share. Now, I should mention that there is an, a feature within Hatch that does show connections to your existing database. So it's organic lead gen, organic prospecting through your existing database. We will show you two categories. Number one, we will show you people that are connected to your people if they sit on, let's say, the same C-suite in a company, mm -hmm. and that's public information, mm -hmm. if, they, if they sit on the same board of, of you in a, in a nonprofit or in a foundation, that's public information, we will append that to their profile so they can see who they can make connections to. Mm -hmm. We're also going to show you people that follow your people on Twitter, if they have a Twitter account, and we'll show you who are those people are, are, are mega influencers. So if John Smith has somebody who follows him on Twitter and that person has 20,000 more Twitter files, we're going to make sure that Hatch shows you that information. So there is when you, you know, if you start with your database, there are ways to organically grow from there. Wow. Now, I, I this is perhaps an unfair question, but if it's OK, I, you said I could pretty much ask you anything. You provide dozens of of, of pieces of information on on. On, on every donor in, that's sitting in the file. Is there perhaps like one piece of information that you would say like stands out like this is something that's like, wow, this is something that like every fundraiser would dream of having this information and you provide it in Hatch. You know, I love that question because it's a hard no. <laughs> okay. It's a hard no. Okay. And I think- Thank you for at least not turning off the mic on me. Yeah. You know, like, no, it's a hard no. And storming I storming out of the yeah. studio, you know? Like. Um, this is a great studio, by the way. I'm very Thank comfortable you. here. Thank so you. I'm not going anywhere. It's a hard no, and I'll tell you why. If you have one piece of information, you go on that information, you can, it's, you could, you could head down a really scary path. Right. The idea is to create what we call a complete human profile. It's multiple pieces of information that build this character. Okay. So if I find, I see one person, oh, I gave a million dollar gift to this organization in, in 2005. So, you know, that's very, very weak data to go on. I mean, what's happened to him since then? Right. Okay. Why did he give that gift? Do you, are you seeing a trend of, of that, of that gift? But let's say I see that one piece of information, but I also see that now he is either the CEO of a big company where I see, okay, there's this trend of him still being capable of giving. Or what if I see that he gave that one gift and now I know from Hatch he's retired. Okay. So then maybe you think, right? So it's all about creating what we call a complete human profile. Dozens and dozens of little pieces of information 
that 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 comes together to create a character, to create an individual, and that is qualified information. I think a lot of fundraisers out there who are using other prospect researching tools that are just looking at this kind of stale one or two pieces of information. He lives in a fifteen million dollar home. Well, do you know that he also owns ninety percent of the mortgage, or do you know that he lives? He's, he's still living with his parents. Like, right, like <laughs> so, so, so. It's it's about it's about dozens of pieces of information coming together to create this complete human profile that the person looking at it can make an educated, um, and 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 an artful you know, assumption and prediction around this person to help qualify the ask. Now, if there is one piece of information that I would say is a good start. Okay. Home value. Okay. Because first of all, home value is hundred percent accurate. If the organization gives us their home and their address, there's no John Smith problem. There's no checking right. to see. Right. It's where it's a, they live. It's where they live. So that's a good place to start. Start. So you would go onto the platform and like sort of sort your entire database by who has the most expensive home. Okay. I was just on with another organization the other day. They sorted their entire database. They Who has an expensive home? First came home. It was a $75 million home. Okay. We went a little further into it. Good start. Okay. It's the family house. It's it's part of the thing. But it started to give them a sense of the thing. So that's a good place to start. It's always 100% accurate. It always kind of gives a sense. And then from there, you can go and veer out into all the other pieces of information that help color this individual or that family and so on and so forth. Moshe, we've known each other a long time and in a variety of different positions aside from charity and now especially in, in Hatch. You've managed to successfully combine working in the nonprofit space and in the corporate space. Can you please talk about that? Yeah, sure. So honestly, I feel like uh, extremely blessed um, because uh, very, very rarely I've been able to eat my cake and have it too when it comes to um, how I spend my time and my career. You know, I grew up in a family that, uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal actually wrote an article on my family many years ago. I've spoken about it this few times that called us the, the largest rabbinical family in, a, in America. That's uh, precisely around the time where fake news started. So I don't know if that's, if that, if that's right. true, um, but, you know, it does give some color to my background. My grandfather ran a very, very prominent, my grandmother ran a very prominent nonprofit organization. Most of my siblings uh, run social and social um, and enterprises. So it, for me, it was kind of in my in my in my destiny and my stars. Like this is what you're supposed to do. You start you're supposed to start a nonprofit, right? Um, but simultaneously, I had entrepreneurial ambitions. I had artistic ambitions. I had a music career for a while. Um, we'll probably start that up at at, at 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 some point again in some in some capacity. But, Go for it. You know. So I've had these you know, almost seemingly conflicting entrepreneurial ambitions. Um, so what happened when this opportunity started at Charity and now at Hatch, where I'm able to A, build a scalable business that's going to help thousands of organizations that is go that that is going to generate millions and millions of dollars of of, of revenue Tens for both if not hundreds of millions for both the, the entities the nonprofit entities and for the business I itself so uh, so i mean i i get everything and and directly you know some passionate. people have to you know they're passionate about giving to charity so they have to build a business and sell jeans they're not passionate about jeans or they're not passionate about uh you know vanity selling vanities but eventually they'll give to charity for me it's all completely in, in interlocked i could build a successful uh, a business and have, have built a successful businesses in this space while at the same time helping people helping people so i feel like i'm doing what i my calling at scale Special, special. Now, let's uh, hold on to the nonprofit world. Fundraising is no easy feat. Um, you know, what suggestions do you have for a director of development, a fundraiser, to raise <clears throat> major gifts or even a tip or, or two on peer-to-peer yeah. -peer giving? Yeah. You know, it, it's really simple. And any, any professional fundraising consultant or anybody person who's been in this space for a long time will tell you that ultimately it's all about building relationships. Okay. Um, but I think there's a nuance here that we have an opportunity going into, uh, you know, 2024, 2025. We have an opportunity under this umbrella of building a relationship. When you think about like, what is a really good relationship? Think about a really, really good friend, a really, really good friend. Okay. 
It's not just that he comes to your parties or he's the one that's invited to your inner circle or spends your, you know, backyard time with you. A really good friend, one of the most important qualities of a really good friend is that they can predict what you like, predict what you need, right? What we're doing is we're giving organizations and fundraisers predictive power for their constituents where when they're able to say, look at all of this data and look at all this information, okay? Like a true friend and can say, you know what? Based on this information and based also together with my relationship, I have this predictive power where I know what program and how much and for for which particular group of children or which particular group of things is going to make the greatest impact for you. Because ultimately our job as fundraisers is to make our philanthropist and anybody giving $10 to make their dreams come true through their giving. So what you have at your tool right now is the same way a friend should be able to finish your sentence, right. should be able to know exactly what you want for your birthday, should know when your birthday is, right? <laughs> right. right? We're giving that power now to the fundraisers, whether they're asking for a million dollar gifts or they're asking someone to join a crowdfunding campaign to give them that predictive power to be able to know exactly how to align their philanthropy with your cause. Within three years of inception, you have over 150 clients and including some very major universities. Can you tell us what you feel is the biggest driver of your success? That's a great question. You know, I reflect back at what made charity.com succeed. Um, and I will say that while we had some pretty talented people, while the original founder, Yehuda Gerwitz, was in very much, in, in many ways, a visionary, Okay. Um, so there were a lot of good components there, but I think that when we reflect back, the greatest driving of our success was that we were riding a wave right before it took off. Right. Um, and it takes a visionary and it takes an entrepreneur to see, to know before that corner to ride the wave, but ultimately you ride the wave. Right. So with charity was riding the wave of crowdfunding and now we're riding the wave of, of data and, and AI. Um, and I think a, a, a successful business is not creating a market. A successful business is not trying to force a solution to an industry, but a successful business is saying like, the industry is moving in this direction. Like data is needed for so many things. Data is needed today for AI, for machine learning, for all the generative AI. Data is needed today for enrichment. So data as a, as a solution is the calling of our of, of, of our time. If you're able to monetize that, you're able to develop a solution for a particular audience. That's great. That's I believe is the greatest driving success. So it's not about your your particular talent or your particular gr group of people. Those are all very very important, but they're secondary things. The primary thing is that you're at the the right solution at the right time for the right audience, and that's riding a wave. Now, Moshe, you go you, you your face lights up, <laughs> and you're like. You feel like, I, I, I feel it, like you're about to jump out of the chair anytime we talk about this, you know, the hatch. And apparently, it's not, not just apparent, it's so obvious. It's what you love to do. Yeah. Just a question, because again, you have life experience in addition to uh, being at the, at the forefront of some latest, greatest technology. How important is it for any visionary, any CEO, or even anyone at their desk? to love what you do, be passionate about it, be involved with something that you're just, you're crazy about. Yeah, I think it's a critical component. I think it is the ingredient. I think it's the salt in, 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 the, in, the, in the recipe. Um, and it, you know, it's not something that you could be taught, passion. It's not something um, that, you know, you know, it is a little bit contagious. You know, when you're surrounded by passionate people, it is open contagious, but kind of fades away. It's something that either you have or you don't. You know, I'll tell you a quick anecdote. My grandfather, who was the chief rabbi of Australia, Rabbi Chaim Gutnick, he was once brought down to to give a a, a class on public speaking to a group of women, okay. and he got up and on on the on the talk and his Australian. I'm going to do a terrible Australian accent, and he says, okay. uh, you know, uh, it, the, so he says, uh, you know, the the trick to public speaking is either you got it or you don't. And okay. then he sat down. So it's one of those things that you either have or you don't. Passion is one of those things. And then he got back up and he gave the and he gave the and he gave the whole the, the whole talk. But the passion is something that you know 
if you're an entrepreneur, if you're starting something, you're found something, you're at the high level, something on the ground floor. If these problems don't keep you up at night, then I don't know what's going to drive you. Like, you know, take something secure, get a good job. If, the, if you have problems that aren't, then it's, yeah, it's one or the other. Looking down the line, and we touched on this earlier in the interview, you're, you're changing the world of, of fundraising in the nonprofit world. Okay. But I'm saying to myself during this interview, Hatch has got to have a solution in the corporate world. We understand data mining in terms of acquisition, lead gen. Uh, am I putting you on the spot? Am I asking something confidential? Like, no. do you have something up your sleeve for the corporate world? Yeah, no, we definitely uh, intend to pivot towards companies. Hatch can be used for salespeople to qualify leads. Exactly. It can, it can the be used. World of sales. Yeah, and and if you do, if you do, if you are out there and you are a company and you'd like to explore that, we are beta testing with different in- industries. So definitely reach out. What I'm most excited about are brands that are doing CSR, corporate social responsibility, and where Hatch can help measure um, the impact and qualify the the donations that they're making. So if I'm Nike and I'm busy giving a $10 million gift to animal rights and they have no idea if, they're, if their customers or their employees actually care about animal rights, Hatch can come in within a day. We can run all their data and we can say, well, actually 70% of your people care more about environmental. So you're throwing all this $10 million toward, towards this, you know, maybe the, maybe the greatest and, you know, the, the hottest and greatest new uh, cause out there, but it's not what your employees or customers actually care or are, are thinking about. And that has a bottom line impact on the company because if they're, if that company, if that customer sees that this brand is more aligned with the things that I care about and they're donating to or doing some type of volunteer effort to the donations they care about, that's going to create loyalty with that, with that brand. I hope it's not a chutzpah to ask you this final question. Sure. Okay. You were at Charity, and Charity is still a thriving company. And yet you're, you're, you have that entrepreneurial bug in you, and you're just going after, you know. What, perhaps you could share. You Obviously, you're, you're a risk taker. Perhaps you could share a tip or two for those out there that have a vision. They, they, they want they, 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 there's something beyond what's in front of them now, but they're a little nervous, yeah. right? Because, you know, you're comfortable. Yeah. You're obviously someone that's comfortable in the uncomfortable. Yeah. Could you talk about that? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. It's having me think a little bit. I, I, I would say like this. I, I think risk is directly correlated to ambition. Okay. It's a direct correlation or maybe a causation. But definitely correlation correlated to 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 each other, um, and I think it's important to know yourself. There's a lot of you go through social media, and there's a lot of pump up, you know, people out there. Take a risk, take a risk. Well, not if it doesn't. Not if you're that. If you're ambitious, right? So I would say, you know, if you're not that ambitious, and you don't have a picture of a lifestyle that you want to live, or how much charity you want to give, right? Um, then take less risk. There's no, there's no need to take less, to take so much risk. Build a, you know, get a profession, become something that 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 doesn't, you know, either learn a trade or whatever, take a risk, and 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 that should be aligned with your ambitions. But if you have a picture of what type of lifestyle you want to live, or how much you want to contribute to society, whether through an impact that you're making or through dollars and cents of how much you're giving or building or doing, then that's directly correlated to the risk. The greatest ambition is is directly correlated to the level of risk. So if you want to make uh, just around $10 million, you're going to have to take a lot of risk to get there um, because you're creating something from nothing, right? You're creating something new. Usually people who have who are exponentially successful are creating and delving into worlds that didn't exist before. They right. came up with something new. They innovated. They made an in- invention, an in- innovation, and that caused some kind of an exponential return. So I think the answer is like just know yourself. What? How ambitious are you? are you? If you're super ambitious and you think you're going to do with a little bit of risk, you're in for big trouble. If you're not so ambitious, don't take that much risk. But if you are super ambitious, know that you are going to have to take an equal amount of risk to get to where you're going. 
Moshe Hecht of Hatch That AI. What an incredible episode. Thank you very much. What an incredible episode of Mind Your Business. Catching up with Moshe Hecht was a real treat, formerly of charity, and now on to Hatch. You know, it was great hearing from someone with that level of experience on how knowledge of your donors can lead to greater gifts for anyone in the nonprofit world, and it paves the path for for reaching out to future donors. I'd love to get your thoughts, your comments, your feedback. Please put them in the comment section below, and please join me on an upcoming episode of Mind Your Business. Mind Your Business.